And good evening, everybody. It's week three of the purification program. So you made it through the first week. You've made it through the second week. One more week. You can do it. I know you can. So we've got a switch of supplements from last week. That's going to stay the same. But tonight, I really wanted to talk about the fats of life. So that's what we're going to talk about. So I have a couple of things to talk about. And I did a recipe for the in class on Monday night. And I'm sorry that I can't share that with you. Uh, or have some type of way you can smell it. It doesn't work that way, but um, I'll show you the recipe. I'll send it the copy of the recipe with the link that I sent for the recording for those that are not on the call tonight. So here we go. So last night I made a, and we had it for tonight for our, our dinner. I did a Dr. B's coconut curry soup with chick, chickpeas and hearty greens. Super easy to make. Um, I made it all in a, a, a skillet and then I put it into the um, crock pot. So then I just added stuff to it. Really tasty. The only thing that I would say is the red curry paste, which I got the Thai curry paste that you can find at Publix. Wasn't the best. I just ordered some um, today and uh, I, when I get it, I'll, I'll send the link of what it is. So you might, if you really like the red curry flavor, I would switch to something like that but super easy to use the fish sauce. So you can make this vegan if you wanted to, just don't add the chicken and use, uh, instead of using the fish sauce, don't use anything. And instead of the, when you use the chicken stock, you can use organic vegetable stock. So it was quite tasty. Uh, we added a little bit at, at the class, we added a little bit of dried uh, uh, cilantro and a little bit of red pepper flake if you want a little bit of a spice to it super easy to make. And uh, like I said, we had it last night and this night. So it was delish. You could also serve it over a cauliflower rice to kind of be a little more keto. I didn't add a lot of the chickpeas, just enough for a little bit of flavor and a little bit of uh, surprise bite in there. So now you've heard me say this before and the way I say it, it sounds really crude because you hear me say, whatever you put in your mouth is either an act of nutrition or an act of suicide. So technically, this is how it's supposed to be said. The food that you eat can either be the safest and most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. So <clears throat> that's where I get that. I just shorten it up and make it a little worse. So on the other side of the slide here, you see the deadly problems with our diets. And, you know, I have to say that it, it's a little bit, uh, you know, scary when you look at the uh, low whole grain intake, it contributes to 24,000 deaths because people don't have enough fiber. We have a, we're just rampant with, you know, uh, colon cancer nowadays because people don't eat as well. You know, and we don't eat well that it's like a, a colon cancer instance when we're eating a lot of white flour and refined sugar that just kind of gets accumulates in the house of this, the, the stuff, the intestines. So the house are the outpoutings in the intestines and that white flour and white sugar just kind of beds in there and hangs in there. If we're not eating enough grains or enough, it's not, sorry, grains, enough fiber or a whole, like even if you're doing a quinoa or wild rice, which is technically a seed, that is really great for just going in and acting like a bulldozer to kind of clean the, that house dry and get that, the, uh, the white flour and the white sugar out of there. And remember the white sugar and white flour, the only difference between cake and rat poisoning is probably the flavor so, uh, or the sugar. So we don't, you know, we eat that and it just gets packed in there. So, and then it becomes, you know, putrid and builds a, you know, almost a, like a methane gas. So you can see the overwhelming responsibility of food in our diet that happens when we don't eat well. So the diet for the next 15 to 21 days is, or is the same as last week. Nothing changes, double the veggies to the fruit, um, try to eat as much organic as possible. You can have unlimited sal salad. Do you want to have seven salads a day? please go for it. You are so welcome to go for it. Uh, so salads unlimited, you can don't do a pre-made dressing, you know, cause they're usually full of high fructose corn syrup and trans fats, uh, but maybe use some olive oil, use some lemon with that olive oil or some really good quality balsamic vinaigrette, vinegar, I'm sorry. But remember when you go to get the balsamic vinegar, cause I know that a couple of places like down here in Mount Dora, we have a place where you can get the balsamic vinegars and the olive oils, but they add a lot of sugar to those balsamic vinegars. So you wanna be super careful with that. We're working really hard to get all that sugar out of your diet. So we don't wanna replace it with something that you think is healthy. So nothing really changes. You know, you can have your oils, you know, the, the, your extra virgin olive oil, your flaxseed oils, your real butter, um, coconut oil. If you're gonna have quinoa, only one half cooked serving per day. 
If you're gonna have lentils, you can have two half cup servings per day. So if you're really trying to do a weight management program, I would just really encourage you to kind of keep those out of your diet. Um, they're not very inflammatory, but they are a little bit higher in carbohydrates. So for me, when I'm having patients that I'm working with that are having a weight management issue or blood sugar issue, these are two things I really pull out. So tonight we're gonna to talk about the danger of these seed oils, you know, that, uh, that's what I call it, the fats of life. I teach an eight hour seminar on that, the, the fats of life, and it goes into a lot of detail and I'll, I'll share some of that with you. But I, I think it's really important that you understand the why of everything and why we don't wanna do these. And when we're talking about seed oils, we're talking about canola, corn, cottonseed, soy, sunflower, safflower, grapeseed, and rice bran. They're very, we call them the hateful eight. Well, you know, they're polyunsaturated vegetable oils, and these are made up of corn oils, cottonseed oils, soybean oils, safflower oils, and the peanut and canola. And remember, canola was touted as like the health oil. I mean, it was the oil you should eat to be you know, heart healthy. Well, we're going to dispel all those little uh, wondrous things. So the original natural fats were available were tallow, soot, and I, I mean, I personally have not had either. Uh, lard and butter. Now I have had tallow. We have our, uh, we get uh, our community share program had tallow for us, but these are things we just don't use that much anymore. Maybe a little bit of lard. I mean, when I was growing up, my grandmother would cook bacon and save the bacon grease and cook off that all the time. Uh, butter, you know, we're, we're all, our family's all in on the grass fed, grass finished butter. It just tastes better. So, you know, we used oils in the beginning as lubricants for machinery in the industrial revolution. And we did that from cottonseed oils, uh, you know, whale oil for blubber. Uh, cottonseed oil was a big one and it was uh, really used, uh, you know, virtually for just about everything. So in order to really produce these oils, they had to hydrogenate them. So when they hydrogenate them, they take one uh, of the bonds and they break it off so that it doesn't look like the other. So these are two, uh, two of the oleic and uh, elatic, sorry, elatic acid are, these are not hydrogenated yet. But what happens is they take a bond where the double bond is where between the two carbons right there in the middle and they change it. So they flip that around. And basically it's like taking your arm, right arm and putting it where your right leg is and taking your right leg where your right arm is. It doesn't resemble anything from what it started with. So they do this whole process of hydrogenation. They use pressure, they use heat, they use hexane as a solvent, and then they have a metal catalyst that makes a very rancid mixture. They have to steam it to kind of clean it of the bad odors. They bleach it to remove any of the gray color. So then they have this kind of uh, uh, whitish, no colorish kind of substance and then they have to winterize it. So they pr process it so that it, it becomes stable. Then they add artificial flavors and synthetic vitamins and call it healthy. And that's what margarine is. And that's how they hydrogenate some of these oils. So Crisco was one of the big first ones. And uh, that was the one that entered the food supply first. And it was great because it, you know, it stayed, keep, kept the foods a little bit healthier, not healthier, that longer lasting. So you didn't go get rancid quickly. Uh, it was easy to store uh, and they would tout that it was better than butter for cooking. Taste wise, I don't know about that. So either we use the real stuff or then we have the tested recipes by Crisco. So this was uh, early on and we had to, you know, kind of get involved in that as a, as a marketing scheme for, for us. And, and you can see how the marketing over the years has really, really just kind of skewed what we do. So these two guys, William Proctor and James Gamble. So I'm from Cincinnati. So I was born in Cincinnati. So I, I try to pick stuff that I think is kind of fun. So in 1800, Cincinnati was like the heart of the developed US. Uh, my, my dad's dad's dad was actually like the big wig of the city. He saved the city at one point. There's a street named after my great, great grandfather. So it was kind of cool, but they called the, the Porkopolis because it was uh, swine wheat was the most popular meat. And but before refrigeration, you know, it didn't make sense to cut up a big old cow. So they would just take a pig. It was smaller and it could be cured and be stored easier. So you also have to remember that pork production also was important for uh, tanneries for making boots and for upholsters. So it became like a hot commodity. So the animal fats that they took from that were rendered and they made them into soap and candles. So the depression hit, it caused the two city, citizens of Porkopolis, the Mr. Proctor and Mr. Gamble to join forces 
and they to cut costs and then to be able to survive in this that, that marketplace. So William Proctor brought his candle making business. James Campbell, who fled from Ireland, he was a potato uh, during the Great Potato Famine. He became a soap manufacturer. So they actually sought inspiration by Psalm 45, 8, uh, you know, saying that all thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia out of the ivory, can't see my whole thing, yeah, whereby they have made the gilly. So, you know, it, it has a lot of history to it. Um, one of our patients last night explained to us that uh, by mistake, somebody left the um, processor on so that it was, you know, stirring the soap, but they left it on too long and it stirred a lot of air into it. So that it made it really lightweight. So that's how the actual ivory soap became a, like it is and it. That's why it floats because it's full of air. So you, know, you can see all these uh, magazines. I'll put a couple of these up. Uh, this is an issue of popular science from the era that sums up the evolution of cottonseed. What was garbage in 1860 was fertilizer in 1870, cattle feed in 1880, and table food and many things on and many things else in 1890. So you can see how you know productive we are as, as molding something into what was you know industrial to something we actually eat. So the marketing of Crisco really came in heavy-handed. You know, with it, you know, if you're a housemaker or a, you, you, that's just what you did, you baked and you used Crisco to do that. And then when margarine was the second thing that came in. So that was the big process that we use hexane for. Um, they had all different kinds of margarines and the oleomargarine. So the big stink about this, where they were, the, the signs down at the bottom, they were saying repeal the anti-margarine laws. What happened was two guys decided that, well, butter didn't get taxed. So they made margarine and they colored it yellow and sold it as butter but they got busted for that. And so that kind of threw the whole margarine thing out. And that was the only reason they threw it out just because somebody got busted for taxes, but they would actually sell the margarine in kind of a whitish gray uh, blob with a little yellow packet of flavoring and color. And they could ship it across the line because it was they didn't know that it was margarine. And then you were instructed to take the packet, break it up in, in, in the, the ball of goo and, and make it into margarine. Fortunately, we don't have to do that. Um, I, I, I recall a story about that. I, I've not seen it. So maybe you have or somebody know somebody that has seen it. Usually great grandparents in, this, in that era. So vegetable cooking oils were really great. So we had Mazzola, we had Wesson oil. Uh, and these were great because you could take them to high temperatures. And that was really good for cooking. And so a lot of our fast food restaurants they call it fast food for a reason because this was a fast way to cook food by using the oils that they could take up to high temperatures. And if you think about like a vegetable oil, I'm sorry, a olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, a macadamia nut oil or an avocado oil, they don't have a very high boiling point. In the instance of our own human body, our temperature is 98.6, give or take a few tenths here and there. So our body temperature would never get high enough to even burn those oils off. And we're talking about the, these oils, are, they're bringing them up to 180, 200 degrees to boiling temps to be able to cook foods. So our body temperature would never get high enough to even burn these oils off after we eat them. Hence, there's a you know, big population that you know, lived on these oils that you know, would get these uh, fats built up in their systems around their heart, around their uh, arteries and, and their organs, but also that that hard fat that you see from, uh, you know, like in women that have really heavy hips and very large thighs, it's that hard fat. And that's mainly from eating those, uh, those seed oils, hydrogenated oils. So here's the whole story. Back in 1961, the American Heart Association recommend, recommends that polyunsaturated oils fight heart disease. This, so this whole paper came out and the guy there in the middle, Ansel Keys, was one of the big pushers of all this. So they went through and they told everybody, uh, you know, saturated fat, which is your animal fats, bad, causes heart disease. That's what kills everybody. And that's what, where strokes come from. And this was all prompted by Ansel Keys. And he came up with what they call a diet heart hypothesis. And he said, if you eat saturated fats, you're gonna die heart attack or stroke. So eat the polyunsaturated fats, these trans fats that we're talking about that are so bad for us. So it all kind of started back in 1955 when Eisenhower had his heart attack. He was a big meat owner, eater. And so when he, that happened, that's where they're like, well, see, this was what happens when you eat, you know, red meat, 
our leader of our country had a you know heart attack or stroke. So we need to stop this. So and so this is what kind of spurred this initial diet and heart hypothesis. So you know here's what happened. You can, can see the on the where saturated fats. You see where butter, lard, and tallow from the time of that 1955 era then just kind of crashed and burned. And down on the bottom one, the unsaturated vegetable oils took a very, very sharp rise from 1955 and on. So there was quite an impact on the, on the nation. So then they had the Heart, uh, American Heart Association was launched by actually Procter & Gamble. How convenient. You know, the Crisco guys made this up. So they did this whole Heart, American Heart Association. And to this day, you can buy products that say heart healthy on them. And it's only because they pay $50,000 to get that little emblem to put on their food. Think about Cheerios. Think about a lot of the foods that you know are not heart healthy. And so they have, they're able to put that on there. As a consumer, a person sees that and somebody that's not educated, you know, like our, the, your friends and neighbors that I want you to explain this to, you know this, that those things that say heart healthy are really not heart healthy foods but the average person doesn't have that education and they select their foods by that little emblem that says heart healthy. So this is where this all kind of got started. And so the American Heart Association said, vegetable oils are the way to go. Crisco, Mazzola, Wesson, they're your friends, but especially Crisco because Procter & Gamble started this whole fuss. So they you know, came out with, a, this is an advertisement for Wesson that says dietary fat and its relation to heart attacks and strokes. Basically, what that article said is that the physicians are telling you, you should only eat vegetable oils because that'll save you from having heart attack or stroke. Totally wrong, totally incorrect. And to this day, it's still happening. So then they were like, okay, polyunsaturated fats is medicine. Take this to your doctor. You know, Mazzola, the leading oil, that's, it's pure corn oil. It'll lower your cholesterol. And then on the other side, should an eight-year-old worry about their cholesterol? feed them margarine, you know, so it's like just mind blowing in my opinion. So taking that heart healthy diet hypothesis, testing it. So they did a couple studies. There were a large, you know, uh, number of government funded randomized and controlled clinical trials. Altogether, 75,000 men and women were in this trial and the experiment lasted anywhere from one year to 12 years. The result of that was there was no effect of saturated fats on cardiovascular mortality or total mortality. No effect, none. So they know this. And this was done, uh, I mean, by the government, government funded, randomized, controlled by clinical trials. So, and in a nearly do dozen studies, it proved that over and over and over again. And still it came out, they're like, you know, side effects of vegetable oils. So here's one of how you can see the actual picture of it. So you can see the control study. The control study were people that just ate animal fats. The experimental group were the ones that their diets were soy, corn, safflower oil, cottonseed oil, and no animal fats. So you can see the, that the men successfully lowered their cholesterol actually on the saturated fat diet than the ones that were on the um, unsaturated, polyunsaturated fats. So the ones that ate the animal fat actually had lower deaths. So, you know, and then the post-diet phase, you can see on the control group, once they went back to eating those oils, then their, their uh, post-diet phase, they, the, the deaths increased. So once again, we know these things. So they found some other uh, health effects, uh, two times higher of uh, getting gallstones. They also found cholesterol lowering. They did a cholesterol lowering drug trial, which came out of all of this. Uh, strokes increased. Um, they were two to three times higher rates of stroke, even if they had low cholesterol. And that was from eating these polyunsaturated fats, corn oil and possible cirrhosis of the liver. These are all health effects that they know, but they still kind of bamboozle us as uh, Americans that, uh, hey, you know what, it's still healthy, it's okay. So they did this whole study, and this is the NIH, uh, National Institute of Health, the, heart, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. So they did workshops three years in a row, and they came to the conclusion that vegetable oils did not present a public health challenge, did not contradict the more urgent common sense public health message for everyone to lower their cholesterol. So they're once again promoting this idea. So you can see how the 
the public was affected by that. You can see the changes in the fat consumption in the U.S. just in this, you know, almost 100 years. That if you look to the the on the the graph that has the B on it on the left side of your screen, you can see how shortening the just increased dramatically. And then butter, which is in blue, was a sharp decline. And then on the C, you can see how soybean oil went way up, and then the canola oil went way up. And these are all in the 99, 1999. So, you know, we're already at a massive consumption of these oils, which are bad for us, but we think they're good. So, you know, why, what, why, how does this happen? So reason number one, the U.S. government gets on board with the USDA dietary guidelines in 1980. And so they say, eat all these grains, six to 11 servings a day. You can have vegetables and some fruit, a little bit of milk and cheese, a little bit of, you know, fish, and use your oil sparingly. So we're told this. So, and this is happening. We still are having strokes and heart attacks and people getting obese and hypertensive. And it's not because of the oils, because they're telling you not to eat them, but it's because of the grains at that bottom of that triangle. So reason two, hydrogenated oil becomes the backbone of the food industry. If you go down the aisles at your local store, we have Publix here. I mean, you can go down the aisles and see all the products that have it in. You can pick up almost any bag of chips. You can pick up any uh, baked goods that are on the shelves there are going to have some type of hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated oil. And reason three, so palm oil and coconut oil came out as natural alternatives, which they were, but they had a reason, they had a campaign against the tropical oils. This guy here, Mr. Drake, he was the um, president of the association, the, the American Soybean Association. So he didn't want anybody using tropical oils because that's gonna cut into his soybean, uh, uh, the producers or the farmers and anybody that produces the soybeans. So then they had a whole thing, you know, saturated fats, while the hubbub over coconuts that, and when we looked at coconut oil, they said that 72% of the American population said, hey, coconut oil is healthy food compared to 37% of the nutritionists. Now, mind you, you can still go to the hospital today. You can still go look at the American Diabetes Association or the American Heart Association and look at the diets they tell people to take these days. Still loaded with carbohydrates, loaded with sugar, and it just blows your mind. And a typical, we talked about this last night in the class, we have um, some uh, medical professionals in the class and they're saying a typical diet at the hospital for a diabetic includes orange juice and fruit. It's crazy. And you know, we see like a uh, heart healthy things like oatmeal. Well, it's a carbohydrate and it just got that heart healthy thing because Quaker Oats paid that $50,000 for that little emblem. And I'm sure, I'm sure it's more than 50,000 now. So then they're trying to go, okay, Let's just let's put these things out here and Bayer will fund this. And they found that uh, soybeans help protect hearts. And the reason why they say soybeans help to protect hearts, because they actually donated money for seeds sold and they contributed five cents to the American Heart Association's Healthy for Good movement. And they've had a donation of 500,000. And that's how they said it helps protect hearts. It wasn't that it was healthy for the hearts only by the fact that they paid the money and they could say that that was helping because they did the research, which wasn't accurate. And then number three, the campaigns against tropical oils. And then you have uh, Philip Sokoloff. He was a Nebraska millionaire. Guess what he was busy um, investing in? Soybeans, crops like that. So he came out saying, hey, you know what? We're poisoning America. You know, this is, this is, this is, this is wrong. Uh, using uh, tropical oil. I mean, we shouldn't use tropical oils. We should use soybean oils and corn oils and other vegetable oils. Uh, the tropical oils are dangerous. We're poisoning America. You should use Crisco and Weston and Mazzola. So that's where they had. Reason number four, advocacy groups, they had campaigned against saturated fats. And it, right in the center for science and in the interest of public, the public interest, healthy hydrogenated oils were not a bad bargain when it came to heart disease. Still, all this is just untrue. And, you know, I think what it boils down to is that, you know what? They made a mistake and it's ego that keeps them from admitting it because now how are they gonna backpedal and change all this from 1961 to say, oops, we made a mistake. So then they said, well, we'll just partially hydrogenate things. Well, it still contains trans fats. So in Marie Ennig, who's amazing, I have got a couple books by her. She's an amazing researcher. 
you know, these companies, Crisco, Procter & Gamble, they're not going to pay her to do research because she's going to say, oh, that, that's not true. That, that it does cause this. You know, saturated fat is not bad. Polyunsaturated is crucially bad for people. And the same thing with, uh, with Fred there. I mean, he's passed on, but these are all scientists that research and they know the data. And some of the books, it's just like incredible. When you read it, you just feel like, you know, the rug's been pulled out of underneath you because it, you can see all the untruths. I'll put a couple of books in to kind of look at if you are interested. I'll put this in links tomorrow morning. So even FDA labels trans fats, you know, they target trans fats in food. So they have a label on there that says trans fats and you can say no trans fats, but I'll tell you what happens. So what replaces trans fats? So basic instability of polyunsaturated fats is what we had to deal with. So the vegetable oil options were to replace the trans fats with genetically modified soybeans, sunflower oil, which would have been fine it was, if it was expelled or pressed, but no, they took the seeds and hydrogenated them. And then interesterified oils, we don't even know what that is. They just add stuff to oils and then we get to eat them. So remember, we're adding hexane to do this process. So when we look at going back to the saturated fats, this is dietary guidelines from 2015 to 2020. This, so this is current. They said that only 10% of your calories should be saturated fat. So guess what the other ones are? They're talking about the polyunsaturated fats now. So they're really trying to sneak this in on us. So why is it so hard to escape from all of this? It's in restaurants, it's the cheapest option. You know, it doesn't, it's, it's cheap to get a vegetable oil because you can take it to high temperatures. You can reuse it over and over again before you have to replace it. Think about when you try to saute a vegetable in olive oil or butter in your uh, sauce, in your frying pan. You know, uh, when, you, when you melt butter, it browns very quickly. It doesn't have a very high boiling point. So it's very fragile. These vegetable oils, they're sturdy oils. They last a long time, not only as a cooking oil, reusable, but also on the shelf, which is helpful for manufacturers. But the other thing you have to think about when we talk about your seed oils, they're very high in omega-6s. And when we hear omega-3, we think about fish oil, and that's your EPA and DHA, and those are anti-inflammatory. Your omega-6s are in some nuts, like peanuts. Um, chicken has a little bit of it if they're fed grains. Your eggs will have more omega-6 if the chickens are fed grains, your beef will have more omega-6 if they're fed grains. If they're fed grass or, you know, or uh, they run out and eat what they're supposed to eat like bugs, they don't have, a, they're not high in omega-6s. So you are what they ate. So that big inflammatory effect. So like doing the 21 day, when I have a patient who may have not had a, a, a good start with their diet and they're really trying to remodel their, their journey in life. Um, you know, they have health issues that are kind of, you know, frightening them, uh, diabetes, hypertension, obesity. I have to take them from eating those processed foods, which are very high in those omega-6s to eating whole foods, which are rich in omega-3s. So when that person eats that first week, their reduction of their joint pain is almost immediate and they just can't believe how better they feel. And it's simply just by eating properly. So, you know, it produ produces a lot of toxic oxidation products. And, and when we have oxidative stress to our body, it creates cancer. The, the, the cells become oxidized and they, they become cancerous, cancerous. So that's why we do antioxidant foods like your vegetables and your fish oils. Those are antioxidants. They reduce that inflammation. They reduce that toxic oxidation. So I'd like to say this is a short introduction to a very terrifying topic, but when we're talking about this whole process of, of hydrogenating, we're using aldehydes. We're using, you know, these aldehydes have, you know, terrifying, you know, side effects. They cause rapid cell death. They interfere with the DNA and RNA. They disturb them just a basic cell function. They have extreme oxidative stress, which is how cancer happens. And the other reason why we talked about sugar last week, sugar feeds cancer. So that's why we try to get those things out of our diet. It's implicated in Alzheimer's. So, so neurodegeneration happens. Um, it also has a, a marker for cancer. Um, you know, acro acrolein 
that that has inflammation and acute infection it causes a lot of GI problems and it just really causes that what we call an acute phase response. Like when COVID first um, came about, people got really, really sick initially because they had what we call a cytokine storm. And that's just the body's dramatic attempt to go, oh my gosh, we've never seen this before. What do we do with it? And it just attacks the body. So we have that. Now we don't have it as much because the body's starting to get used to that. So McDonald's used to use you know, French fry their fries in, in tallow or used to fry their French fries in tallow. Not anymore. So we have monounsaturated fats and we have polyunsaturated fats. So we want to look at those, um, and you know we we just want to. It's not that you can't have them. We just want to really stay away from the polys. So the takeaway lessons about the oils, you know, avoid the polyunsaturated fats. When we talk about like um, monounsaturated, like the oleic acid, that's your olive oil. Polyunsaturated fats are always hydrogenated. So for salad dressings, use real olive oil. You want extra virgin olive oil. That means it's the first press and it's usually a speller press so they don't have to heat it. And cold press for any seed oils is ideal because heating the oil up damages the oil. And like I said, olive oil, macadamia nut oil, avocado oil, they're very fragile oils. Butter is a very fragile oil. So for cooking, use your saturated fats and avoid your fried foods in your restaurants, which I know you're not gonna do anymore anyway. But we have advice coming from experts. And this is a scientific report from 2015 dietary guidelines. And you know, basically it says sources of, it's still, this is 2015, still saying sources of saturated fat should be replaced with unsaturated fat, particularly polyunsaturated fatty acids. We just went through all this, how bad it is for us. And in 2015, we're still saying, oh yeah, go ahead and, and eat it. It's okay. So, you know, get back to the, the basics. And that's why I want you to have real butter. You know, I, I, had, I had to throw this in. It's, it's, it's cute. It says, he died last Friday. Thank God he wasn't beaten. Don't worry. He, was, he went over easy. He's now on the sunny side. On the sunny side. He's definitely in a better place. Uh, you gotta make you laugh somehow here. So, you know, knowing why these oils are bad, when we talk about the polyunsaturated fats, they're the bad cholesterol. They're the low density lipoproteins that kind of settle in the, in the, the arteries and the veins. The HDL, they're like the WD-40 for the, the arteries and the veins. They kind of fly, fly a little bit higher in the arteries and they kind of create some lubrication so nothing sticks. The LDL just creates that sludge. And if you create enough sludge, it just narrows the passageway. But most doctors don't test a complete lipid panel. They don't test the VLDL, which is the very low density lipoprotein. This is truly the bad guy. And when I do any functional medicine testing, I always do a complete lipid panel because I want to see that VLDL number. Because you can have a naturally high LDL because maybe you're doing keto, but it doesn't mean you're in bad health. If you're VLDL, it's like a score from four to 20. The lower the score, the better. It's kind of like a golf game. Uh, so I use that as more of a measure of somebody's cholesterol health. So take a look at your blood work. If you have questions, um, at the end of the, the 21 day, I always offer uh, a $25 gift card to you to come do a functional medicine appointment. We'll pull some real blood on you to, I won't do it, I'll send you out for it, of course, but we'll do a really complete blood panel and get the things that they don't normally test, you know, and we want to look at, is it in the middle? or is it at the bottom of the barrel? So we wanna look at where those numbers really are. So when we talk about the hydrogenation process, I just wanted to throw you in, you know, this is what they use is hexane. It's actually a peripheral neurotoxin. So it kills brain cells. Uh, it's, it's a colorless odorless liquid, so you wouldn't know it, uh, but it's used in the formation of glue for shoes, for leather products, for roofing, Occupational settings are dangerous for chronic exposure. It's used in extracting oils from seeds. That's your polyunsaturated fats. And they are uh, also used for obtaining, uh, refining crude oil. What a, what a bonus. So, you know, here's all the hazards from it. You know, there's acute hazards, chronic hazards, but the EPA still has not classified hexane as a group D. So they don't classify it as a human carcinogen yet but there's no information available. So they don't really know the total effects on it. 
But when rats are, uh, it's, a, it's applied to rats, they do have neurotoxic effects. Not that we're rat-like, but you know, similar brains and structures that, I mean, sometimes I feel like I have a rat brain, it's so small. So then, you know, this whole fat thing. So, okay, we can't have fat. We, 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 we do take the fat out of everything. And then all your food tastes like crap because it has no flavor. So what do we do? We add the sugar in. So remember the snack well cookies? And I always giggle about this because we all did this because we think, oh, I can have my cookie and eat it too. But look, it says right here, trans fat, zero grams of trans fat. But if you look over here in the ingredients, it has soybean oil or palm oil. How, is, how do they get that? And then partially hydrogenated cottonseed oil, the same thing they use to, for industrial machines they're using in, in your snack well cookies. So, well, how can they say that it's in here, but oh, they don't show it. Hmm. Well, I'll tell you about that later on, but also look at these cookies here. So high fructose corn syrup, dextrose, sugar. So they have three sugars named in there that they kind of hide from you. So I gave, I had that list of 61 sugars that we put in the email last week. So they, they just hide those things in there, but 19 grams of carbohydrates. And remember the cookies are like this big, you know, if you had two cookies, it was like, okay, I can eat the whole box, which most people did. So it really didn't serve any purpose for the, for weight loss. And then you have your margarines or your vegetable oil spreads and they tout no trans fatty acids. And when you see, uh, this is an old label because they don't, they, now they have to put trans fats on there, but right here in the ingredients, partially hydrogenated soybean oil. It's right there. And they can say no trans fatty acids. Well, that's trans fat. So, you know, it's right there in front of you. And then they have hydrogenated, I didn't circle this one, but hydrogenated soybean oil. So it's in there and it may lower your LDL by 14%, but it's certainly not heart healthy. So when we look at the difference between why saturated fats opposed to trans fats, I mean, you could just look down this list, you know, the positive effects of saturated fats, it's just essential for healthy function of your cell membranes. It enhances your hormone production. It suppresses inflammation. It lowers your uh, LPA, your uh, good cholesterol, raises, lowers your bad cholesterol and raises your good cholesterol. It puts in uh, omega-3s into the tissues to conserve it in there, helps insulin receptors. It enhances your immune system and encourages production and balance of your prostaglandins, which is to decrease uh, inflammation. And the trans fats do completely the opposite of that. And then you can look here on the right, you know, stay from any away from any of the butter spreads and the butter substitutes. We all did, I can't believe it's not butter. Well, it's not in parquet, it's butter. No, it's not, it's parquet, you know. So we remember all those commercials, but look at all the soybean oil in these, these products. Soy lecithin, um, you know, they kind of hide it in them, the mono and diglycerides. Those are kind of hiding in there, the names for your trans fats as well. So um, we've just been kind of, bamboozled all these years. I don't know why I like that word. So this is a, she's a chemist and she says, as for butter versus margarine, I trust cows more than I trust chemists. So in the little picture on the right, this was a, taken from, I think it was an experiment of some kid did in, you know, elementary school or junior high school. They put margarine, reduced fat butter and real butter and the ants made the right choice. We have a much bigger brain than these little tiny ants. And we can't even make that decision for ourselves. What are we going to do with us? So when you look at trans fats, you're going to look at foods like French fries and donuts, and chicken nuggets and cakes, breads, pie crust, cookies, all the stuff that you think is good for you, not. So now you're, they're estimating 40% of the foods in the typical U.S. Uh, supermarket contain trans fats. That's why I can stay on the shelf so long. So you see all these labels on here. So I wanna kind of just delve in there on that because I think that's super important for you to understand and be able to read the label because that's where the misinformation happens. So let's do a little reading label basics 101. So one gram of fat is nine calories. One gram of carbohydrates is four calories. One gram of protein is four calories. When you look at a label, a nutrition label, the FDA requires it to be in this order. They give you the calories, the calories from fat, serving size first, gives you the fat first, cholesterol, sodium, potassium, carbohydrates first, the protein, and then vitamins are listed. So the way we figure out the total calories of an item, and I just added up what they said was here. 
So one gram of fat is nine calories, and we multiply that by 4.95, which gives us the 44.55 calories. We took the gram of carbohydrates, which is four calories, to the 20.8 grams, which is 80.72 calories. And then the one gram of protein equal four calories, we multiply that by 3.6, which gives us 14.4. That gives us a total of 139.7. But if you look in the nutrition facts, the calories there say 137. Ooh, what's missing? Hmm, I wonder what. So this is where we get you know, in trouble because we're trying to do the right thing. And I have patients coming in all the time, showing me their food long, and I can see they're desperately trying to do the right thing. How can you? You, you don't have the right information. Or you have the information in front of you, but they've kind of hidden things in there that you don't know. So I'm letting you know. So here's one of my little trips to Publix. You know, I, I tell my story about Publix, why I'm not allowed to go. You know, patients come around the corner with their basket. They see me and they're like backing up like, oh, I, Dr. B can't see this. So, I, you know, it's fun that I see them in the checkout line. And they're like, oh, yeah, I never get this. I'm like, we're well, getting it now. And, you know, I always talk about my uh, display of sugar in the office. And it makes me laugh because I had to go almost to land to go to a store that wasn't near here because I would have died and, and you know gone to hell if a patient would have said, oh, see, I see what Dr. Basudin's buying. Uh-huh. I see what she's buying. So yeah, I don't buy that stuff only for displays. So when we talk about trans fats on the label, and look at this label here, it specifically says no preservatives, no cholesterol, zero grams of trans fats. Well, no cholesterol just means it doesn't have animal fat. That's all. But it says zero grams of trans fats. And it says that right on the label. I have the arrow pointing right there. But then when you look in the ingredients, the second, third ingredient is partially hydrogenated soybean oil. And then a little high fructose corn syrup in there too. And I think there was one other place in there. Uh, there was, uh, yeah, there's soybean oil in there too. So we know that that is, you know, hydrogenated. So that's, that's that. So if you look here to the left, you want to check the ingredient list in food packages for partially hydrogenated oils because nutrition, sorry, the nutrition facts label can state zero grams of trans fat in the food if it contains less than 0.5 grams of trans fat. So even though that says zero trans fats, even though you clearly can see there are two types of trans fats in there, they can say 0.5 per serving. The serving size is five croutons. If you've had a salad, you, I know you eat more than five croutons on that salad, especially if you're putting the croutons on that salad. So right there, anything over one gram of uh, trans fat a day is can be deadly. So you would think you're doing the right thing because it says zero trans, trans fat, but you're getting it in there. And it says that if this product contains partially hydrogenated oil, it might contain small amounts of trans fat, even if the label says zero grams of trans fat. And there's your FDA government food. You can go to that label right there or uh, that web address and that'll pull up that exact thing that tells you that. So read your labels. I mean, we can't go, I, I mean, poor Mary Ann, when she goes to the grocery store, I mean, it takes, she says, it takes me forever because I have to read all the labels because we don't want to bring that stuff into our household. We eat a lot of whole foods, but there are some things we don't, we can't get and we have to buy. So all fats, are they bad? No, we have good fats and bad fats. So good fats are butter, lard, chicken fat, cold pressed olive oils, sesame oils, flax oils, tropical oils that are cold pressed and um, expeller pressed. Those, the way, with, those are the words you wanna look at and organic, I like that too, um, compared to the, the bad oils. There are any, any and all partially hydrogenated or hydrogenated fats. That's margarine shortening, any industrial processed uh, vegetable oils, canola oil. And remember, canola oil was touted as a health oil. It's hydrogenated. The seeds are extracted with hexane. How can that be healthy for us? We already saw that it was neurotoxic. Maybe that's what's wrong with our world today. So hidden trans fats, these, these are the words you wanna look for. Hydrogenated oil, partially hydrogenated oil, hydrogenated coconut oil. Now coconut oil is good, but you can go to Publix and get Luann's coconut oil and you read the label and it says hydrogenated and it's not organic. So spend the extra dollars. You can go to Aldi, you can go to Sam's and Whole Foods, um, uh, Sam's and Costco and get big, massive things of it. 
uh, that is that are organic and expelled or pressed or cold pressed. Uh, so soybean oil, palm kernel oil, anything that says hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated. And if you see um, soybean oil or vegetable oil or corn oil, you know that it's going to be hydrogenated. Any seed oils have to be hydrogenated unless they specifically say expel or press. So you know what to look for now. So this is what I, I like to talk about. <laughs> it kind of makes me giggle. So this is food marketing translations. So when, when uh, they write these things on your packages, this is what it really means. So when it says no sugar added, it means instead we've included a variety of sweet tasting carcinogenic chemicals. And if it says artificial flavoring, a horrible mix of chemicals that will trick your brain into thinking you're eating something healthy. Natural flavoring means a tiny drop of lemon or something added to the chemical crap listed in item two. Low fat, instead of fat, we've added a chemical cocktail that is worse than fat ever was. And number five, an essential source of vitamins and minerals. We've added a salad of unavailable vitamins and minerals to hide the rest of the garbage that we're feeding you and your children. So it's your choice what you put in your mouth. Make it a healthy one. So I won't go into this real quick, but I just kind of want to, these are some of the, the chemicals that are in there. It's a whole different class I teach, but I always just kind of like to throw this in because this is also part of why we detox. And we have BPA. And I think that more than a, uh, easier to, for you to remember is that when we get a can of food, you want to turn that can around and look around and make sure it says BPA free. BPA, and I'll talk about this just for a moment, it is the number one neurotoxin. I mean, it's, it's gonna damage your, I'm sorry, uh, endocrine toxin. So it damages your endocrine system. That's your ovaries, your testes, your adrenal glands, your thyroid glands. You know, those are major glands in our body. So it definitely disrupts those endocrine gland systems. So we wanna make sure we're stay away from those. So, I mean, you know, fire retardants, lead, arsenic, hopefully you're not around that. Mercury, as a kid, we thought it was the coolest thing to break a thermometer over and play with the mercury. It's lucky you're still alive. Maybe that's what's wrong with us. So, you know, when we talk about, you know, getting food and uh, things that are better for us, you know, if we're going to eat meat, we know we're going to eat, they're, we're eating what they ate. So uh, there's a company called Moink, uh, moinkbox.com. They have um, ethically sourced and exceptionally taste, good tasting grass fed and finished beef. They have lamb, pork, chicken, uh, wild seafood, and it can be delivered straight to the doorstep. So uh, free shipping, you know, I don't get anything from this, but I just try to find sources for you to find things. We also have used vitalchoice.com and you can get your grass fed uh, beef there, but it's mostly for, uh, we get a lot of seafood from there. You get crab and halibut, and salmon. Because when you go to the grocery store, you'll see salmon and it looks beautiful. Then you'll notice it says farm raised. And what they've done is they've fed those salmon pellets, give them color, and they're feeding them grain pellets. Fish don't eat grain pellets, they're fish. So what are we avoiding still? You remember, if it's not in that program guide, remember the last page of your program guide here is your food list. If it's not on here, you may not have it. I, with the exception, I said you can have uh, free range eggs um, and you can have nut milk as long as it doesn't have sugar in it. So still we're gonna stay away from these oils. Now you understand why I'm so you know, emphatic about staying away from the oils. You see how they're produced. Uh, caffeine and alcohol, still no. Uh, your uh, Coffee, tobacco and other stimulants, no. And if you're smoking, you should stop anyway. Uh, soft drinks, regular and diet, no. Nuts, beans, dairy and grains, no. So processed or refined foods, still no. Dried canned vegetables or fruit or cured smoked luncheon meats, no. Um, and even after the 21 days, I'd make a decision not to add those things back into your diet because we know they're not good for them. You just spent 21 days getting all that crap out of there. So I like this little picture because it really says what I tell patients all day long. Being fit is 80% diet and 20% exercise. You can't outrun your fork. So what you put in your mouth, you know, in the mouth, on the hips, there's a lot of measure to that. But now we say in the mouth to the liver first. So your supplements stay the same as last week. Five green food twice a day and five gastrofiber in the morning, four gastrofiber at night. Me, I just do five and five. I just keep it simple. 
So you can continue with animal protein, but it's okay if you just want to use plant-based protein. I mean, we still don't really add, we had a little bit of chicken in the, in the soup that I made last night. Um, we've had some eggs and, and some, some fish and that's just about it. So we generally just haven't had a lot of it. We still kind of stay plant-based. So great health is a journey, not a destination. So enjoy it. You just don't get healthy and stop. It's a, it's a process. And as you learn more, you have to do better. So one more week, hang in there. I know you can do it. I know you can do it.